Hi, I'm R. And I'm Jay. And in this video, we'll be refuting a video by Answers in Genesis regarding the age of the Earth. We also have geologist Purple Dan joining us to help out, so let's get to it. Nearly every textbook and science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. You make it sound as though radiometric dating is a singular method. Radiometric dating is an umbrella term for a large list of dating methods including, but not limited to, radiocarbon dating, potassium argon dating, and uranium lead dating. All of those methods are independently verified and results are compared to ensure there are no inconsistencies. But whatever, keep going. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay, so if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? And that seems like a lot. If you actually do the math, that is a 1.1% variation in results. That's actually really good. Yes, 50 million sounds like a lot, but as a fraction of 4.6 billion, it really isn't. You were just trying to appeal to a lack of scientific knowledge in your audience. You don't have that luxury with us. But let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Well, AIG, now this is the part where we hand you over to an actual geologist, Purple Dan, to investigate your terrible claims, as our geology kind of sucks. Enjoy. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Translated into, let's grade and really easily kill straw man, because we know we know jack shit. Well done. Well, well done. Well, well, let's see. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. That's correct. Nuclear decay is the process where a nucleus of an unstable atom loses energy by emitting radiation. In the case of uranium-238, it undergoes a decay chain with several other unstable isotopes, eventually ending with lead-206, which is stable. Now please tell us how we use this phenomenon to date rocks. It's commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. Ha! You sneaky fuck! Lead is not a gas at mental melting temperatures. You're referring to the dating method of potassium argon. Argon is, and can only be contained in a rock with a solid crystalline sample. Mantle rock is not exactly solid. Well, molten mantle, anyways. So it escapes. Sure, you're correct. You're using this example just to confuse your audience and make your straw man even easier to kill. That once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. That is the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. That is sort of correct to say. It's more correct to say that half-life is the time required for half of the entities to decay on average. It's a very good approximation to say that half of the atoms remain after one half-life. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Yeah, we can measure the decay rate. Really fucking accurately. To an order of microseconds. Anyways, we geologists, we don't look like that. But yes, we can measure the age of the rock sample using the radioactive properties of the isotopes in the minerals of that rock. What's your point though? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science. Observational? Historical? 
but science is science. What the fuck are you on about, mate? Hey, dudes, could you please help me out? Could you please explain to a pleb like me what the fuck he's talking about? Thank you. Ugh, it's, it's pretty much as stupid as it sounds. Rather than accepting that science is simply a process of making controlled observations to better understand reality, they try to divide science into two categories. Any scientific investigation which deals with past events they call historical science, and everything else falls under observational science because we can supposedly observe the results in real time. What they obviously don't realise is that all science, even that which makes assertions about the past, is based on controlled observation and rigorous scrutiny of those observations. Determining the truth of past events is just making an assertion about reality as we understand it from those observations. By placing the past in the category of historical science, they are asserting that factual claims about the past can't be made using radiometric dating, because if you weren't there to observe it directly, then you were just making assumptions. By their logic, we can't work anything out we didn't directly see happen, so huge chunks of accepted science and even the concept of criminal investigation mostly falls apart. I know, genius, right? Fucking serious? What? What? <sighs> Why do I do this? Why? Why? Uh... It's require both types of science because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Okay, sure, but we know these things. We can measure the decay rate of the rocks, as is now. We can then run experiments on the rock and see how that changes the decay rate. For instance, we can heat the rock up, we can put it under immense pressure, we can put it under water, we could leave it in the sun. All these things would show us if there's any change in the decay rate. Going back, we can check the decay rate in order of microseconds, so any of those things would come up clearly, we would see a discrepancy. But we don't. We just fucking don't. Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. Okay, well, of course we can't just pick up the rock and, 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 uh, and measure the age. Or can you? Psst. Hey, get granite, shoot granite. How, how, how old are you? Nothing. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, that just made me feel so fucking dirty. Um, go on, please, please just go on. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? Geochemistry, experiments, hand samples, we can taste the shit. How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? Because again, we can taste the shit. I guess obviously the following is going to be very difficult to understand for creationist cunts. For the rest of you guys, it's easy, it's simple. First, we need to know what zircon is. Zircon is a zirconium silicate. It consists of four oxygen atoms connected to a zircon atom with a silicon atom in the bond. And obviously this will make up the whole crystal lattice of the zirconium crystal. Zirconium is incorporated in igneous materials you can find in granites, which is what I will be using as an example right now. Here you have a total melt. A total melt would be obviously completely 
liquid. It's no crystalline structures, so any sort of atoms is free to move around. Eventually, it will cool down and fractional crystallization will occur. Some elements will combine and start crystallizing out while the rest will still remain in a fluid state. Now, during this uh, period, major elements will start to coalesce. It follows the Bowen's reaction series, which I'll link in the octopus tank below. Your first minerals will start crystallizing out and leaving the rest of the minerals outside. These minerals would be usually be rare earth elements or um, what we will call trace elements. They are incompatible. They don't want to be in that lattice. Eventually, you'll find that it's cooled down enough so that there's very little fluid remaining and some of these incompatible elements will be forced into a crystal structure where they fit of course. Uranium-238 is a high field strength for incompatible um, trace element. Uh, lead-206 is a large iron lithophile element which is differently incompatible as in uranium will be incorporated into zirconium crystals when zirconium is crystallizing out and lead will not be able to get into the spots. It will just not fit. Well, physically and atomically speaking. The physicists out there, they could explain you more. I'm a geologist. I'm a fucking bleb when it comes to physics. Anyways, uh, you will have holes open. Holes. Or uh, places where uranium can substitute zirconium or any other mineral for that matter, or element for that matter. See so if you have the uranium stuck in the zirconium crystal, it cools down, you're done. You have a solid crystal with clean uranium inside that crystal. No more lead in the zirconium crystal. See? Now, eventually lead will incorporate itself into a different melt and a different crystallization when it's cooled down completely. But there's still one thing remaining. There's no elemental lead in the zirconium crystal when it forms. That means the time clock has started ticking and we can use that to measure it. Now zirconium is a pretty resilient crystal. It's not susceptible to weathering and in case it's also in case usually an igneous material like granite, which is even more unsusceptible to weathering. It's a really fucking strong rock. So you can have Eons pass by where this zirconium crystal is just stuck in this rock and nothing is touching it. The problem these people have is that they think the crystalline structure will allow any sort of lead to come back in and go out again. It's just not possible. It's a solid crystalline structure. If uranium is stuck in there, it's stuck in there. The only way to get that uranium out again is when you melt the crystal back down again. And obviously, we geologists, we're not fucking stupid. When we go and we investigate a metamorphic material, we don't ask ourselves, oh, these crystals probably formed during the metamorphosis. No, it fucking didn't. We know that if it had gone, gone any sort of metamorphism, it'll probably go into fraction and crystallization again if the metamorphism is of a high enough grade. Then we know the clocks will be reset. The lead of the, the decayed lead will be extracted out, uranium will be incorporated back in, clean, clock, reset. We fucking know this. Okay? It's, it's not like you're telling us anything fucking new. Okay? There's papers and papers written on the subject, on how we have to make our assumptions and how we have to calibrate our instruments when we measure these things. We don't just pull these things out of our fucking asses, unlike you. Again, if uranium is incorporated in this crystal lattice, the only way lead would be incorporated in that crystal lattice is when the uranium actually fucking decays. There we go. The lead is new. No more lead coming in, low lead going out. Besides, when we actually go and take the rock samples, we don't just pick up a rock sample like, hey, there we go. This is a rock sample. Oh, it looks okay. It's a bit weird, the boys. No, we fucking don't. We go look for a whole bed. We break it apart. We go take clean samples. Not just one. We take a metric fuck ton of samples. And then we analyze them. And then we get an error rate. We get an average on how the lead is incorporated into the zircon. And if we don't find anything useful, we search until we find anything useful to use. If it's not lead, it will be something else. Potassium argon could also work. 
Seriously, you people... <sighs> it's not much more I can say, really. How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? Because we use clean samples that are not contaminated and not weathered. The half-life of an isotope does not change over time and is not affected by temperature and pressure. Well, for most isotopes at least. Uranium is no exception. The answer is, they don't. Let's yes, we do! <sighs> Fuck. Guys, I'm done. Thanks, Dan. I'm surprised you were patient enough to deal with them for that long. We'll, we'll take over from here. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. No, don't talk about a typical hourglass. A typical hourglass is not the same as rocks. I know where you're going with this, and it's a false equivalence fallacy. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong, because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Congratulations, you just showed us a great example of a false equivalence fallacy. As Purple Down already outlined, there are reasons why issues like that aren't a problem when it comes to radiometric dating. All that you have shown us is you can't assert how long an hourglass has been going for. I know what you're trying to do here. You grossly oversimplify a complex scientific issue and then attack the oversimplification because you don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to finding the actual science in its entirety. Well, of course there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. Yes, there is considerably more to this discussion than your terrible straw man. There has clearly not been enough said by you to actually discredit anything other than yourself. And with that, I think we're done here. Thanks for watching this video, and special thanks to Purple Dan for doing the hard science for us. Go check out his channel, there's a link in the description. If you aren't subscribed to our channel, make sure you do that right now. Like this video and share it around to help us raise the bar of public discourse.